Hello everyone, I am Tokunaga from the Graduate School of Frontier Sciences. This is a pilot program of the Bird's Eye View Lecture. As part of taking a bird's eye view, I'd like to think about the subsurface. Of course, you can't take a bird's eye view at a subsurface environment. So you'd probably need to have a mole's eyes. Unfortunately, most moles seem to be biologically blind. Although it is still difficult to see below the surface. Considering how the underground environment and associated science and technology is related to our society is a topic of discussion. So I prepared some materials for this topic. I'd like to give you an opportunity for us to think together. So there are five things I would like to share with you today. First, what are subsurface environments and underground spaces? How are they relevant to our society? What are the characteristics of the subsurface environment? The subsurface environment might be slightly different from the surface where we live. Another thing is when you are taking a look at the subsurface environment, what kind of technologies need to be utilized, and what should we consider so that we can better utilize the subsurface? Another characteristic of utilizing the subsurface, which will be a very important point going forward, is that we need to have an ultra-long-term view. It could be a thousand or ten thousand years from the perspective of engineering. So that is something I'd like to also propose. And then another thing is that I'm just touching upon some keywords when it comes to the subsurface. You may think this is a very much localized story. But actually, subsurface environment is quite relevant to global issues. So I'd like to touch upon some of those keywords toward the end of my lecture. Underground malls and tunnels are probably the most relevant subsurface environments to our everyday lives. I work in Kasua, and there are a lot of tunnels connecting Kasua and Tokyo. Also, there are roads and underground malls. We use a lot of those underground spaces in our lives. And if you take a look at the middle photo, this is about energy resource stockpiling underground in Japan. As you know, we don't have many energy sources in Japan. And because of that, to secure enough energy, we have to stockpile energy sources underground. And you may not be able to understand how big this is, but if you look at this, this is a microbus. This is 30 meters by 30 meters by 500 meters, and several of those tunnels are being constructed. LPG and oil resources are being stockpiled here for the purpose of energy security. Another purpose of the underground is to deal with wastes that are produced by our lifestyle that are difficult to handle. They need to be stored and processed underground. For instance, this graphic shows disposal of high-level radioactive waste from nuclear power plants, which is done underground. CCS, you may be familiar with this term, CCS or CCUS, which means that CO2 is collected and captured and then stored underground to avoid the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. This can also contribute to the overall reduction of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So for such a purpose, we can use the subsurface. One good thing about the subsurface comes as a result of very serious study. Ten years ago, on March 11, 2011, was the date the Great East Japan earthquake struck. 
That's when eastern Japan was hit by a tsunami. The Tohoku region, as you can see, was struck by a huge tsunami. Many of the facilities on the surface were destroyed. There is an old NHK TV drama called Amachan, which was set in Kuji in Iwate Prefecture. In the underground of Kuji, there is a stockpile of oil totaling 1.67 million cubic meters. All of those above facilities were destroyed by the tsunami, as shown in the right photo. But the subsurface storage facility was unharmed. It's possible to make wise use of underground spaces. But of course, we have to have good engineering to find stable sites underground for such usage. And yet another importance of the subsurface is that many of the resources we use are extracted from underground. If you take a look at the photos on the left-hand side, natural gas and iodine are produced from a depth of approximately 800 meters, as you can see. About one-third of iodine in the world comes from Japan, as shown in the figure below. So Japan is a very important contributor in terms of iodine supply. So we can take those resources from underground, and also gold, silver, and platinum. And many metal resources are from underground. Furthermore, groundwater from the subsurface environment is commonly used. The planet Earth is called the planet of water, but actually it is salty water. 97.5% of Earth's water is salt water, and only 2.5% is fresh water. And two-thirds of that 2.5% of fresh water is ice. It's only one-third of 2.5% that's fresh water not in the form of ice, and most of that is groundwater. So groundwater is a very important natural resource for us in terms of available amount. Groundwater is also an important natural resource from the perspective of heat. The groundwater represents the average temperature of that region. As water has a very large heat capacity, if you want to make use of the heat, I think this is very beneficial. For example, if you look at the photo at the bottom, this is Ojia City in Niigata Prefecture in 1945. And you can see this electric pole. Back then, snow was discarded on the road. They would clear the snow so that people can pass through, and they would pile the snow up to the height of the electric pole. In the early part of the 1970s, they used groundwater to dissolve snow. They're trying to do that using the pipe of the road, and that really changed people's lives. So you were not able to pass through the road because of the snow back then, but now traffic can pass after thawing out the snow. This is yet another way that groundwater can be used. And this snow dissolution technology was epoch-making in regions of heavy snowfall. But there were also downsides. Because so many people made use of these technologies, they pumped up more water than they needed to. In some regions, each family has their own water well pump. This means, somewhere in Niigata Prefecture, they have around 8,000 of these wells in a city. This means that everyone uses the same resources. This is a good thing individually, but collectively they face a lack of these resources. This is called the tragedy of the commons, because they extracted too many of these resources. So individual economic benefit has been prioritized, but this does not lead to the best outcome for the commons. I think this is a good representation of this problem. 
And this is something that we need to be aware of as we make use of underground resources. And talking about the subsurface environment, we need to really think about this issue. Because in the underground, there's groundwater. Today we had bad weather, but it has the function to support the water flow. As you can see on the right hand side, the river water is flowing because the ground beneath the river is fully saturated with water. Without sufficient saturation of the water table, the river will dry up. So in Japan, the river water continues to flow without rainwater. Where does the water come from? It's coming partly from the rain, but most of the water in the river is coming from the groundwater, which comes up to the surface and provides water supply to the river. Therefore, this river in Japan will continuously have water, and we are able to make use of that water. So this has the function to support this water flow in the river as well. And there's another characteristic when it comes to the underground. There's much less oxygen. Because rain interacts with the air mass, 21% of air is oxygen, and when it goes into the soil, when it permeates, it will react with the organic matter, and it's used to oxidize. The oxygen will be consumed. And the underground conditions are dependent on the water characteristics. So the underground environment has much less of oxygen. In the early 1970s, there were many accidents in Tokyo. It says location of oxygen deficient air accidents. That is, considering 21% of the oxygen in the air as 100%, this shows the concentration of oxygen in the air introduced to our living environment. If it's a zero, it means there was no oxygen. And when you have to breathe in that air, that is very dangerous. That happened back in the 1970s in many parts of Tokyo. The groundwater level went down because they used a lot of groundwater when the economy was growing. And the level of groundwater went down and the air went into the underground and came back to our environment above the surface. And this caused the accident that I just explained. Now the groundwater level has gone up, so these accidents are not happening. But when you think about these things, when it comes to maybe thinking about developing countries, we can see a similar situation in the cities in those developing countries. We can think about how to transfer the right technologies to those countries to prevent such problems from happening. And then there are also ways to make use of this characteristic lack of oxygen. If you're well versed on how chemicals behave under a reducing environment, you can make use of these characteristics to process difficult to handle waste. And another important point is about the contamination issue. Maybe you experienced this when you were young or small. To get rid of something you don't like, you dig a hole and cover it with soil. That's what we did, historically speaking. Humans did those things. As we discussed before, the waste coming from nuclear reactors must be disposed of. Engineers came up with this disposal method. And what they did was dispose of it in the very deep underground because they thought this was optimal. But a sociology expert said that 
They've been disposing of those unnecessary things in the underground. The engineers who came up with these methods thought that they were making good use of the underground. It's an extension of disposing of what they just want to get rid of. This is a very difficult thing to reach a societal consensus on. I have the experience to really acknowledge this issue. And recently, we've had a lot of chemicals being synthesized and new things coming up. And these are released into the environment. How will these things have an impact on our ecosystem? When we use tap water, is it really safe? Can we trust that it's safe for us? And we need to deal with these kinds of emerging contaminants. This is something that we need to address going forward. PFAS is something that you might see in the news these days. This is one kind of synthetic chemicals. There are also pharmaceutical metabolites. When we take medicine and it is expelled from our bodies and into the drainage system, we think that they will be processed by the drainage system before being released into the environment. But the drainage system and the environment are not totally disconnected. The water going through the sewage is sometimes released into the environment. So these metabolites may be released into the environment. We don't necessarily know how this is going to have an impact on our ecosystem. We need to think about how this is going to impact us. And the next point is forgotten pollution, which is also an important thing in our discipline. In the past, there are a lot of pollutants that have been embedded. For example, after World War II, Japan made a lot of different pollutants and poisonous substances, which were then deposited underground. But there is a record of this, and if we can take care of this correctly, that's good. But that is not necessarily the case, and sometimes people forget about this. But when we develop that land, we find out about those contaminants from the old days. And we need to be prepared to deal with such things. And I think this is necessary for society as well. In terms of the underground environment and society, Yet another characteristic of the underground environment is that it's not man-made, it is made by natural processes. This is a map of Tokyo, this is Shinjuku, and this is the Matsudo area and they are at quite a high elevation. Then we also have the low-lying areas. And under those low-lying areas, 6 meters to 70 meters deep, are old valleys. They are what are called buried valleys. Around 18,000 years ago, that was the most recent ice age. The sea level was lower by 120 to 130 meters compared to now. Back then, rivers flowed into the sea from deeper valleys. Otherwise, waterfalls would be formed on the coast, but that's actually not the case and there are valleys there. Those are the buried valleys under the Tokyo area. This was only 18,000 years ago. There are 60 to 70 meter thick sediments there, and they're quite soft. If you do some kind of construction work, that can lead to subsidence. Tokyo also has regions of low-lying areas, which means we need to fully understand the distribution of those areas where we live. To achieve this, we've been working on a lot of things recently. 
The figure may be difficult to see, but these are black lines. These black lines show that, in the era of high economic growth, we used a lot of groundwater in Tokyo, and the lines show to what extent the water level went down. This is 60 meters below the surface. So after 1945, during the high economic growth era, the water level came down to this level. Then we are looking at the subsidence level here. As a result, from the Meiji era until now, the low-lying part of Tokyo had a man-made 4 meter or more reduction in surface level. This is Tokyo from around the 1960s or so. We had a river, we had a bridge, but the bottom part of the bridge was already being touched by the river. And it's not because sea level rose, but rather because the land subsided. Small boats used to pass under the bridge, but that is no longer possible. As people realized that subsidence is a severe problem, people wanted to stop using and restore groundwater. Now the water level has gone back to 10 meters or so below the surface. Although this seems good, if we look at a station of the Sobu Line in Tokyo, the Sobu Line has a box-like formation. And then at the time when this was constructed, the water, the groundwater level, was here. But then we stopped using groundwater, and then the water level goes back up, as you can see. This box-like formation also has an increased level of groundwater. It's as if you were to float a bowl in a bathtub, then pour water into that bathtub. Due to buoyancy, the bowl would rise along with the water level. And we have to respond to that problem. And Ueno Station in Tokyo has a similar problem. We had to spend 500 to 600 million yen to remedy this situation. There's the environmental issue of subsidence, which we respond to, causing water levels to rise, which then affects underground structures. So this is quite a complex issue, and we have to find a solution. That is one of the very important challenges that we face in the 21st century. Recently, BGS, the British Geological Survey, has created this brochure, Future of Cities. So what they're saying is that in designing 21st century urban areas, both the surface and subsurface environment, should be taken into account simultaneously. Not just surface, but also subsurface areas need to be considered in combination. That is what is being pointed out by this institute. So, the subsurface environment is made by natural processes. That's why it could be heterogeneous, or it could be uncertain, because we don't have all of the subsurface information. Also, it is necessary to consider existing man-made structures, because they are there. People now need to come up with an appropriate way of managing such subsurface areas. And so we need to manage all of the human natural systems. We have to fully understand not just human, but also natural systems to create better human societies. So, several years ago, I was exposed to research on this topic. Within this field, the intensification of artifact systems is the focus of research. Examples of man-made or artifact systems being properly designed initially, but proving inadequate with the passage of time. Or special expansion due to external or environmental or internal causes is too numerous to list.
And this phenomenon can be seen as arising because the solution, partially optimized on a certain temporal or spatial level, did not coincide with the required overall optimization solution. And of course, if we can completely modify the entire system, that may be good. But then oftentimes we can't do that and therefore the existing systems must be intensified. So here, intensification means modifying the system to make it better. And so from this perspective, we have to think about the subsurface or our cities and societies and others. So from here, we'll talk about the technology, engineering technology that we need to deal with these invisible things. It's not really something that we can see, so what kinds of approaches can we take? What we use is monitoring technology and modeling technology. I want to talk about these now. So these days, we can see how the surface is moving by satellite, which is called satellite-based geodesy. One thing is using radar to find the change of surface levels, in SAR. So what we do is use a satellite to send electromagnetic waves and measure the return of those waves. When they come back multiple times, the difference between the first and second signals will be detected to understand the subsurface movement. If you look at the middle of this chart, this red triangle represents leveling, a method that will be done only once a year. But by using these satellites, you can get these results shown in dots. So you can see the results from the leveling versus the satellite are pretty much the same. And when the land is subsiding, that's shown here. And when it's swelling, it goes up. By using these technologies, this is the plane of Kanto. There's change from blue to purple to yellow, meaning that it's moving away from the satellite, meaning that the land is subsiding. And this area is really subsided. And this is the place in Chiba Prefecture where our iodine and natural gas are produced. The land is subsiding due to these activities. In Saitama Prefecture, these places are changing from green-yellow to blue. This is where land subsidence is occurring because they're extracting water for agriculture and tap water. And here, this is part of Kanagawa Prefecture. This is like an eyeball, but this is also land subsidence. There's industrial land around this area. After that industrial land was built, Land subsidence occurred because they were using a lot of water for industrial purposes. By looking at the land from a satellite, you can see what's going on in which places. And then we just look at the spatial movements. But we can also see how things are changing over time using GPS. So temporal changes can be observed by GPS very accurately. This is Sanwa in Ibaraki Prefecture and near Nogi Urujima. You can see the image of the temporal change in the same place. The yearly leveling survey shows steady subsidence. But now we can measure it day by day, so it turned out to be really different. It actually goes up and down, but overall it's declining as a trend. So you can see that in the chart, these two lines are totally different. We have this new technology to come up with these results. And post-seismic rebound is something that we are seeing after the earthquake in 2011. So I think this is also helping us to measure things and see the things differently. Because we can really see what is going on on the surface when we try to manage the underground 
We can also model the changes in the underground, and we're trying to do both of these together. And what I just showed you is the leveling survey results versus the actual GPS GNSS measurements where the ground is changing. So when you extract water, it will subside, and if you stop doing that, the land will go up again. You can see that the water level is going up and down every year. It's used for agricultural purposes, so when you pump the water, it goes down, but if you stop doing it, it'll go up. So every year, the amount is pretty much the same. But even though that is the case, land subsidence will still gradually occur. So the actual line is done with calculation. And it is going down as a trend, although it's going up and down on a small scale. The phenomenon that is actually occurring is different from what we had originally measured with the leveling. It is important to understand this point. Furthermore, what we're trying to do is to share this with the community, and we used modeling technology. We monitor, evaluate, integrate the data, and share these data with the local community. If we can come up with these kinds of schemes, the scientists and engineers will be able to make good use of the resources in the environment. And from here, this is a topic that I'm really interested in. As I said earlier, I've been looking at rocks and water. Recently, I focus on the fact that mudstone behaves like a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable membranes are used in water treatment for reverse osmosis. So this is RO, reverse osmosis, membrane for water treatment. And when the water is not that clear, you put this membrane to make it clear. Because only water can go through this membrane. On the right hand side is a slug. When you were children, you might salt a slug, and then they would get small and shrink. That's a semi-permeable membrane effect. Rock also has a semi-permeable effect. This is not my area of expertise. I'm reading a biophysics textbook from the first page. This is a textbook written by famous professors. I'm trying to understand the content of this textbook on non-equilibrium thermodynamics in biophysics to really understand the behavior of the inorganic mudstones. Academia is not really necessarily vertical, because I think there are a lot of similar kinds of ideas being extrapolated into other areas. As a simple experiment, how does mudstone behave when first put in low concentration water, then moved to more concentrated water? This is a temporal change, and the horizontal and the vertical line is the circumferential strain. It is 160 micro strain, and you can see that this is a very huge number for the mudstone. So if you put the mudstone into different water, and this kind of change occurs. It's because of a semi-permeable membrane kind of behavior. You can see these are quite complex formulas. And this can actually explain this physical phenomenon. Therefore, although they are mudstones, they have a certain pattern of behavior. To understand the phenomenon, knowledge of biophysics is needed. We can borrow the existing knowledge from other areas. So of course, you have to focus on your research, but then you have to get some hints from other academic areas. So that is an outcome that I expect out of these more than 600 students. I'd like to speed up a bit. I would like to talk about the ultra-long-term engineering projects and subsurface. As I said, high-level radioactive waste disposal requires an ultra-long-term view. 
So we have nuclear power plants producing energy. And then we have those existing wastes which need to be disposed of. We have some concepts of waste disposal. One is detoxification, which is probably the best way. But when that's not possible, we expect dilution and the dispersion of waste using the carrying capacity of the environment. When that is also not possible, we reduce the volume and then isolate them. The third method is used for high-level radioactive waste. Of course, we have to always use the best available technology. Why is it that ultra-long term is needed? For radioactive waste, we have the radioactive equivalent of one ton of fuel on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. If you consider the radioactive level of uranium as a kind of standard, to go back to that level, it takes tens of thousands of years. That's tens of thousands of years where such waste needs to be isolated from where we live or from society. And for that purpose, underground space is to be used. A site selection has just started in Japan. And this started in a kind of unfortunate way. After the end of World War II in 1948, the peaceful use of nuclear power started. Robert Oppenheimer, a Nobel Prize laureate back in 1948, he said that the waste problem is unimportant and it's easy to deal with. So that was the understanding back then, but 70 years on and its disposal still cannot take place. So with the advancement of science and technology, we now understand we have this problem. The subsurface has the potential to deal with this problem because of the reducing environment. One such technology is where the corrosion of metal is slowed down and also becomes difficult to dissolve. And when there is water in rock, which will be more stable, to be on the surface of the rock or to be in water? In the reducing environment, it is better to be on the surface of the rock. So creating an environment underground can actually make sense for dealing with this kind of waste. As an example of the calculation, we have logarithmic time on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, we have a radioactive dose or additional radioactive dose that we may be exposed to. This line shows the dose of exposure over a year in Japan, one millisievert of radioactive exposure. As for the additional exposure, the level of 10 to the negative 8th sieverts will be released in the following 1 million years. Whether this is safe or not is still under discussion. But when we discuss that, of course you have to consider a lot of different conditions. We want to know what is the highest value in what year, so we have to do this kind of plotting. To have discussions together with relevant parties. What's really difficult is that we have to find the most stable site and through appropriate engineering, facilitate waste disposal. But then in order to explain that, engineers say, what if leakage happens? Of course, effects may be different based on how the leak occurs. So engineers do a lot of different calculations. Then, in order to prove security, they always plan for the extreme scenarios of catastrophic leaks. And then those laypersons, they think, well, that is the extent of the leakage. As the engineers try to explain as thoroughly as possible, it becomes more and more confusing. So we need to have sociologists take part in this kind of discussion, or we need to have humanities specialists. 
So that's why this is a concept, science and trans science. In the red text, many of the issues which arise in the course of interaction between science or technology and society hang on the answers to questions that can be asked of science and yet which cannot be answered by science. And so these are scientific questions. However, the answers may not be coming just from science. So there are many such problems in society. How can we address these problems? And I think this requires a kind of GX perspective. So this is very important. And I'm just saying this, but I don't have the answer myself. So I would like to ask those young researchers to sometimes think about this kind of concept. So I have covered many different topics, and I have provided you with quite a few localized problems. However, the underground or subsurface is related to global issues. One is the water cycle. People are paying more and more attention to climate change. We have the underground environment to support the water cycle. Changes in the water cycle by climate change and the security of water resources. So this is something that we need to address quite seriously. And then a nitrogen cycle and carbon cycle. Once again, the subsurface environment is very important for both. By the Haber-Bosch process, we now have reactive nitrogen. This has brought about a green revolution in food production and also the production of bombs. But as a result of this reactive nitrogen, that is not N2 nitrogen. It's reactive, and then this is released into the environment in a massive amount. And from the perspective of groundwater, this actually contaminates the water and can affect the brain function of, for instance, babies, if babies drink such groundwater. This is a part of a disturbance of the nitrogen cycle on the surface. So we have to take that kind of perspective. It is the same with the carbon cycle. In Indonesia or Malaysia, we have places called peatlands. They are heavily developed, and in order to develop peatland, they have to reduce the water level. And peatland, when it touches oxygen, oxidation occurs. And that is released into the atmosphere and may cause fires. So the amount of carbon that's emitted from the peatland development is man-made. Which is more that has to be discussed. And by discussing that, we have to consider how to best manage our environment. You may think that this is quite a localized problem, but it always needs to be linked with global problems. I think there may be people who are really interested in understanding and thinking about their underground environment. So I have talked about the issues related to the underground environment. Thank you very much.